Shalom. Welcome back. We are uh, continuing with our study of the homilies of Clement. We're up to homily number 16. Uh, this should be able to get it done in two videos. It's longer than the other homilies, though, the last couple we've had, but it's uh, not extremely long. It says, At the break of day, Kepha went out, and reaching the place where he had where he was wont to discourse, he saw a great multitude assembled. And at the very time when he was going to discourse, one of his deacons entered and said, Shimon has come from Antioch. Starting as soon as it was evening, having learned that you promised to speak on the unity of Elohim. And he is ready, along with Athenodorus, the Epicurean, to come to hear your speech in order that he may publicly oppose all the arguments ever adduced by you uh, for the unity of Elohim. Just as the deacon said this, lo, Simon himself entered, accompanied by Athenodorus and some other friends. And before Kepha spoke, he took the first word and said, Okay, so, uh, there are some footnotes. It says, Homilies 16 through 19, giving the details of the second discussion with Simon at Laodicea, are peculiar to this narrative. Much of the matter finds a parallel in the longer account of the previous discussion at Caesarea and the Recognitions. But all the circumstances are different. Um, Ulhorn formerly regarded this portion of the homilies as the nucleus of the entire literature. He has modifi modified his view. An analysis of the, the discussion cannot be attempted, but in the footnote to Recognitions uh, 2.19, a general comparison is given of the three accounts of discussions with Simon Magus. And with regard to the unity, um, the unity of Elohim, it says the word properly signifies the sole government or monarchy of Yahuwah. It means that Yahuwah alone is ruler. So, <clears throat> so when he says the unity of Elohim, he's, he's talking about the monarchy of Elohim. It says, I heard that you promised yesterday to Faustus to prove this day, giving out your arguments in regular order, and beginning with him who is the uh, master of the universe, that we ought to say that he alone is Elohim, and we ought neither to say nor think that there are other gods, because he that acts contrary to this will uh, will be punished eternally. But above all, I am truly amazed at your madness in hoping to convert a wise man and one far advanced in years to your state of mind. But you will succeed in your designs, but you will not succeed in your designs, and all the more I am present and can thoroughly refute your arguments. For perhaps, if I had not been present, the wise men... The wise man might have been led astray because he was—he has no cr uh, critical acquaintance with the books publicly believed amongst the Jews. At present, I shall omit much in order that I may be—I may the more speedily refute that which you promise to prove. Wherefore, uh, begin to speak what you promise to say before us who know the scriptures. But if, fearing our refutation, you are unwilling to fulfill your promise in our presence. This of itself will be sufficient proof that you are wrong, because you did venture uh, to speak in the presence of those who know the scriptures, and now why should I wait till you tell me when I have a most satisfactory witness of your promise in the old man who is present? In saying this, he looked at my father and said, Tell me, most excellent of all men, is not this the man who promised to prove to you today that Elohim is one and that we ought not to think ought not to say or think that there is any other uh, God and that he who acts contrary to this will be punished eternally as committing the most heinous sin. Do you then refuse to reply to me? Um, so, okay, I'm sorry. I, you know, when I, missed, when I read this, I was thinking that Kepha was speaking first, but it says, and before Kepha spoke at all, he took the first word, so... Simon took the first word, and so I was kind of confused when I was reading that. Like, it kind of did, it didn't sound like Kepha. Um, so basically, Simon is kind of. Uh, um, first of all, he's pointing out that the old man is quite a bit older than Kepha. Um, I have heard quite a few people um, theorize that the apostles were actually uh, quite young. 
this would have been approximately seven or eight years after Yeshua's death. And so, um, you know, Kepha may not have been a whole lot older than, than a teenager. You know, he might have been like 25 or, or maybe, you know, 30 at this point. But then again, I mean, there's no way to really know for sure how old he was when Yeshua uh, ascended. It says, And our father, well, much you had demanded testimony from me, Shimon, if Kepha had first denied that he had made the promise. But now, if it shall feel no shame in saying what I am bound to say, I think that you wish to enter into the discussion inflamed with anger. Now, this is a state of mind in which it is improper for you to speak, and for us to listen to you, for we are no longer being helped on to the truth. We are uh, watching the progress of a contest. And now, having learned from Hellenic culture how those who seek the truth ought to act, I shall remind you, let each of you give an exposition of his own opinion, and let the right of speech pass from the one to the other. For if Kepha alone shall wish to, be, to expound his thought, but you shall be silent as to yours, it is possible that, the same, that some argument adduced by you might crush both your and his opinion. And both of you, though defeated by this argument, would not appear defeated, but only the one who expounded his opinion. While he who did not expound his, um, though equally defeated, would not appear defeated, but would even be thought to have conquered. And Shimon said, I will do as you say, but I am afraid lest you do not turn out a truth-loving judge and have as you have been already prejudiced by his arguments. So, um, so yeah, I guess basically, you know, Clement's father is saying, look, look, you're coming out as an adversary. Um, you know, Kepha hasn't even denied that he said this. And, and here you are challenging it as if he was and asking for me to witness against him. Our father answered, do not compel me to agree with you without any exercise of my judgment in order that I may seem to be truth-loving judge. But if you wish me to tell you the truth, my uh, prepossessions, prepossessions are rather the side of your opinions. And Shimon says, how is, how is this the case when you do not know what my opinions are? And our father said, it is easy to know this, and I will tell you how. You promised that you would convict Kepha of error, maintaining the unity of Elohim, but if one undertakes to convict of error him who maintains the unity of Elohim, it is perfectly plain that he, as being in the right, does not hold the same opinion. For if he holds the same opinion as a man who is thoroughly in error, then he himself is in error. But if he gives us proof holding opposite opinions, then he is in the right. Not well, then, do you assert that he who maintains the unity of Elohim is wrong, unless you believe that there are many Elohim, or many gods. <clears throat> Now I maintain that there are many gods, holding therefore the same opinions as you before the discussion. I am presupposed, uh, prepossessed rather, in your favor. For this reason you ought to have no anxiety in regard to me, but Kepha ought, for I still hold opinions contrary to his. And so after your discussion, I hope that as a truth-loving judge who has stripped himself of his uh, prepossessions, I shall agree to that doctrine which gains the victor. When my father said this, a murmur of applause burst in, ten, insensibly from the multitudes because my father had thus spoken. So, you know, uh, Clement's father is basically admitting, like, look, you know, I, I believe in, um, you know, this pantheon of gods. I don't believe in, in one single Elohim. And in case you haven't picked up on it, I try to, I know that Elohim just means you know, gods, but I try to, um, I try to just apply that to Yahuwah, because, um, I, I see no, um, no problem with calling pagan gods by a pagan title or pagan word, which is gods, so that's why I, I usually trans, uh, I usually switch the capital G-O-D, um, for Elohim, but the but when they're referring to these pagan gods, I just say gods. So that's just me. That's just the way I do it. <clears throat> Kepha then said, I'm ready to do as the umpire of our discussion has said, and straight away, without any delay, I shall set forth my opinion in regard to Elohim. Then I assert that there is one Elohim who made the heavens and the earth and all things that are in them. And that it is not right 
um, and it is not right to say or think that there is any other. And Shimon said, but I maintain that, that the scriptures believed amongst the Jews say that there are many gods, and that Elohim is, ang is not angry at this, because he has himself spoken of many gods in his scriptures. <clears throat> For instance, in the very first words of the Torah, he evidently speaks to them as being like, <clears throat> even unto himself. For thus it is written that when the first man received a commandment from Elohim, to eat of every tree that was in the garden, but not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the serpent, having persuaded them by means of the woman, through the promise that they would become gods, made them look up. And then, when they had thus looked up, Elohim said, Behold, Adam has become as one of us. When then the serpent said, You shall be as gods, he plainly speaks in the belief that gods exist, and the more as Elohim also added his testimony, saying, Behold, Adam has become as one of us. The serpent then, who said that there are many gods, did not speak falsely. Again, the scripture, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the rulers of thy people, points out, that, points out many gods, whom it does not wish even to be cursed. But it is also somewhere else written, Did another god dare to enter and take him a nation from the midst of another nation, as Yahuwah Elohim? <clears throat> when he said did another uh, god dare, he speaks on a supposition that other gods exist. And elsewhere, let the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth perish, if those who had made them were not to perish, as if those who had made them were not to perish. And in another place, when it says, take heed to thyself, lest I go and serve other gods whom the fathers did not know. It speaks as if other gods existed whom they did not follow. And again, the names of other gods shall not ascend upon thy lips. Here it mentions many gods whose names it does not wish to be uttered. And again, it is written, Thy Elohim is Yahuwah. He is Elohim of Elohim. And again, Who is like unto thee, O Yahuwah, among the Elohim? And again, Elohim is Yahuwah of Elohim, and again, Elohim stood in the assembly of Elohim. He judged amongst the Elohim. Um, and again, the, you know, I'm saying Elohim now because I'm uh, transliterating scripture. Wherefore, I wonder how, when there are so many passages in writing which tell, testify that there are many gods, you have asserted that we ought uh, neither to say nor to think that there are many. Finally, if you have anything to say against what I've spoken, so distinctly say it in the presence of all. So, uh, you know, you got these uh, footnotes, and so if you want to see the footnotes, it's just the scriptural um, references to all those passages that Simon um, put forth. <clears throat> and keep it said, I shall reply briefly to what you have said. The law, which frequently speaks of Elohim itself, says to, be, says to the Jewish multitude, multitude, Behold, the heaven of heavens is Yahuwah's, thy Elohim, with all that therein is, implying that even if there are uh, gods, they are under him, that is, under the Elohim of the Jews. And again, Yahuwah, thy Elohim, he is Elohim in heaven above and upon the earth beneath, and there is none other except for him. And somewhere else in the scripture it says to the Jewish multitude, Yahuwah, your Elohim, is Elohim of Elohim. So, that even if there are Elohim, they are under the Elohim of the Jews. And somewhere else, the scripture says in regard to him, Elohim, the, tr the great and true, who uh, regardeth not persons, nor taketh for reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow. The scriptures in calling the Elohim of the Jews great and true, and executing judgment marked out the others as small and not true. But also somewhere else, the scripture says, as I live, says Yahuwah, there are no other Elohim but me. I am the first, I am, I am after this, except me there is no Elohim. And again, thou shalt fear uh, Yahuwah thy Elohim, and him only shalt thou serve. And again, hear, O Israel, Yahuwah your Elohim um, is one Elohim, or one Yahuwah. And many passages besides seal with an oath that Elohim is one. And except him, there is no Elohim. Whence I wonder how, when so many passages testify that there is one Elohim, you say that there are many. 
And Simon said, my original stipulation with you was that I would should prove from the scriptures that you were wrong in maintaining that we ought not to speak of many Elohim. Accordingly, I adduce many written passages to show that the divine scriptures themselves speak of many gods. And Kepha said, those very scriptures which speak of many uh, gods are also exhorted as saying, the name of other gods shall not, not ascend upon thy lips. Thus, Simon, I did not speak contrary to what was written. And Shimon said, Do you, Kepha, listen to what I have to say? You seem to me to sin in speaking against them, when Scripture says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the rulers of your people. And Kepha said, I am not sinning, Shimon, and pointing out their destruction according to the Scriptures, for it is written, Let the Elohim who or let the gods who did not make heaven and earth, the heavens and the earth perish. And he said thus, not as though some had made the heavens um, and were not to perish, as you interpreted the passage, for it is plainly declared that he who made them is one in the very uh, is is one in the very first part of Scripture. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth, and it did not say the gods as somewhere else it says. And the firmament shows his handiwork. And in another place it is written, The heavens themselves shall perish, but thou shalt remain forever. <clears throat> and Shimon said, I adduced uh, clear passages from the scripture to prove that there are many Elohim, and you, in reply, brought forth as many or more from the very or from the same scripture, showing that Elohim is one, and he is and he the Elohim of the Jews. And when I said that we ought not to revile the gods, you proceeded to show that he who created is one, because those who did not create will perish, and in reply to my assertion that we ought to maintain that there are gods, because the scripture also says so, you showed that we ought not to utter their names, because the same scripture tells us not to utter the names of other gods. Since then, these very scriptures say at one time that there are many gods, and another time there's only one, and sometimes that they ought not to be reviled, and at other times that they ought, what conclusion ought we come to in consequence of this, but the scriptures themselves lead us astray. <clears throat> and Kepha said, they do not lead astray, but convict and bring to light the evil disposition against Elohim, which lurks like a serpent in each one. For the scriptures lie before each one like many diverse types. Each one then has its own disposition like wax, examining the scriptures and finding everything in them. He molds his idea of Elohim according to his wish, laying upon them, as I said, his own disposition, which is like wax. Since then, each one finds in the scriptures whatever opinion he wishes to have in regards to Elohim. For this reason, Shimon molds from them the forms of many uh, gods, while we molded the form of him who truly exists coming to the knowledge of the true type of our own shape. For assuredly, the soul within us is clothed with his image for immortality. If I abandon the parent of this soul, it will also abandon me to just judgment, making known the injustice by the very act of daring. And as coming from one who is just, it will just, justly abandon me. And so, as far as the soul is concerned, I shall, after punishment, be destroyed, having abandoned the hope that comes from it. But if there is another uh, God, let first him put on another form, another shape, in order that by the new shape of the body I may recognize the new God. But he shall change. His sh but if he should change the shape, does he thereby change the substance of his soul? But if he should change it also, then am I no longer myself, having become another, both in shape and in substance? Let him therefore create others, if there is another. But if there is not. He says, but there is not, for if there had been, he would, have, uh, he would have created. But since he has not created, then let him, as non-existent, leave him who is really existent, for he is nobody except in the opinion of Shimon. I do not accept any other, I do not accept of any other Elohim but him alone who created me. So one of the things that... Um, Keith almost seems to be saying is I, I, he's saying soul, but I I don't think he means it in the terms of being. It almost seems like he's saying spirit. That if he turns, that if Kepha turns from Elohim, the very spirit within Kepha will abandon him because both his spirit was created by Elohim, and so 
uh, his spirit because he comes from Elohim is loyal only to Elohim. Um, and then he's speaking about, you know, if there is a, another Elohim, let him present himself. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't really understand everything about what Kepa just said. Um, I, I paused the recording and reread it, and I'm still not 100% sure. Um, it may be something to, that warrants a little bit of deeper study if, if you have the time to go back and review chapter 10. Um, and Simon said, Since I see that you frequently speak of the Elohim who created you, learn from me how you are impious even to him, for there is evidently two who created, as the scripture says. And Elohim said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now let us make implies two or more, certainly not one only. And Kepha answered, One is he who said to his wisdom, Let us make a man. But his wisdom was that with which he himself always rejoiced, as with his own spirit. It is united as soul to Elohim, but it is extended by him as hand fashioning the universe. On this account also, one man was made, and from him went forth also the female, and being a unity, uh, gen uh, generic, generically, it is yet a duality. I was wanting to say genetically, but... Uh, gen, generic alley. Uh, it is yet a duality, for by expansion and contraction, the unity is thought to be a duality, so that I act rightly in offering up all the honor to the one Elohim as to parents. <clears throat> and Shimon said, What then, even if the scriptures say that there are other Elohim, there are other gods, would you not accept the opinion. So I'm guessing this wisdom here, uh, there's a footnote 1290, I'm guessing that's probably Sophia. Um, this, this is the only passage in the homilies relate, related to the, yeah, I think that's Sophia. The text is in some parts corrupt. It is critically discussed by Ullahorn, some of whose emendations are adopted by Dressler and translated here. So Sophia is like the personification of wisdom, and it's usually uh, a female, um, I guess you could say a deity, uh, always rejoices as with his own spirit. I guess we can read that footnote also. Oh, it's uh, from a reference in Proverbs. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, it is what it is. It, it, that's kind of like a Gnostic type of thing. The you know they seem to focus a lot on Sophia, but it is also talked about in the scriptures. You know, I think it's talked about in uh, Ecclesiasticus that uh, that it, it talks about that in Ben Sirach, the personification of wisdom as Sophia, and you also see that in Proverbs. So it's not totally foreign to the scripture. Um, and keep the answer, as the scriptures or prophets speak of, of God, say, do so to try those who hear. For thus it is written, if there arise among you a prophet, given signs and wonders, and that sign and wonder shall then come to pass, and he, and he say to thee, let us go out and worship other gods, which thy fathers has not known, ye shall not hearken to the words of that prophet. Let thy hands be among the first to stone him, for he hath tried to turn thee from Yahuwah thy Elohim. But if thou say in their heart, how did he do that sign of wonder, thou shalt surely know that he who tried thee, tried thee to see if thou dost fear Yahuwah thy Elohim. The words he who tried thee, tried thee, uh, have reference to the earliest times, but it appears to be otherwise after the removal to Babylon. For Elohim, who knows all things, would not, as can be proved by many arguments, try in order that he himself might know. For he foreknows all things. But if you like, let us discuss this point, and I shall show that Elohim foreknows. But it, it has been proved that the, the opinion is false, that he does not know, and that this is written to try us. Thus we, Shimon, can be led astray, neither by the scriptures nor anyone else, nor are we deceived into the admission of many Elohim. Nor do we agree... To any statement that is made against Elohim. So this is um, 
something that Kifa talks about quite a bit in the recognitions is how to recognize a scripture that's been corrupted by the lying pen of the scribes. And that is anything that uh, says anything against Elohim or shows that Elohim has a lack of foreknowledge or such and so forth, that that's a false scripture. Now, he seems to be saying that this scripture from, I think it's Deuteronomy 13, um, where it says that Yahu is trying you or testing you, that that, I believe he's saying that that is a false scripture because he's saying um, the words he who tried thee, tried thee, have reference to the earliest times. Uh, 1295 says literally, but it had been said that those who tried, tried. The idea seems to be before the removal to Babylon, True prophets tested the people by urging them to worship these gods, but after the, uh, that event, false prophets arose who really wished to seduce the Jews from the worship of the true Elohim. Um, I, I think that what he's saying is that, that those were added after the removal to Babylon. Um, that somebody inserted that into the scripture. And, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of these, you know, scholarly people think that the scriptures were um, heavily edited in Babylon. That that's where these four documents, the, uh, the P document, the, the D document, the E document, the J document, that's where they overall kind of put together and edited and came out in their final form was during the Babylonian captivity. So maybe that's what Kepha's... Maybe Keith is referencing something like that there. Uh, let's see here. It says, For we ourselves also know that angels are called uh, gods by the scripture, as, for instance, he who spoke, spake at the bush and wrestled with Jacob, and the name is likewise applied to him who was born Emmanuel, and who is called the mighty Elohim, or the mighty God. Yet even Moses became a god to Pharaoh, though in reality he was a man. The same is the case also with the idols of the Gentiles. But we have but one Elohim, one who made creation and arranged the universe, whose son is the Messiah. Uh, obeying Messiah, we learn to know what is false from the scriptures. Moreover, being furnished by our ancestors with the truths of the scripture, we, also, we know that there is only one who has made the heavens and the earth, the Elohim of the Jews. And of all who chose to worship him, our fathers, with pious thought, setting down a fixed belief in him as the true Elohim, handed down this belief to us that we may know that if anything is said against Elohim, it is a falsehood. I shall add this remark over and above what I need to say. If the case be not as I have said, then may I and all who love the truth incur danger in regard to the praise of the Elohim who made us. So basically, Kepha's saying, like, look, if you're if your choice is between believing a scripture to be true, which is against Elohim, or believing a scripture to be false, which is against Elohim, the the the, the greater danger is in accepting a false scripture rather than uh, refusing to accept a true scripture because it paints Elohim in a bad light. Um, I think that's basically what he's saying. Um, Notice he says that the name likewise is applied to him who is born Emmanuel. But he doesn't seem to be applying that to Yeshua. Just something, just something to point out there. When Simon heard this, he says, Since you say that we ought not to believe even the prophet that gives signs and wonders, if he say that there is another Elohim, uh, and that you know that he even incurs the penalty of death, and therefore your teacher also was with reason cut off for having given signs and wonders. And Kepha answered, Our master neither asserted that there were Elohim except the creator of all, nor did he proclaim himself to be Elohim. But he with reason pronounced blessed him who called him the son of that Elohim who has arranged the universe. And Simon answered, Does it not seem to you then that he who comes from Elohim is Elohim? And Kepha said, Tell us how this is possible, for we cannot affirm this, because... We did not hear it from him. Uh, now this is interesting. Kepha saying that Yeshua never pronounced himself to be Elohim. But that's largely the way that the church has taken that, right? 
That's what the church does, church doctrine. Kifa would get kicked out of Sunday school for that. <clears throat> it says, in addition to this, it is the peculiarity of the Father not to have been begotten, but of the Son to have been begotten. But what is begotten cannot be compared with that which is unbegotten or self-begotten. And as Shimon said, is it not the same on account of its origin? Kepha said, he who is not the same in all respects as someone cannot have all the same ap appellations applied to him as that person. And Shimon said, this is to assert, not to prove. And Kepha said, why do you not see that if the one happens to be self-begotten or unbegotten, they cannot be called the same. Nor can it be asserted of him who has been begotten that he is of the same substance as he who has begotten him. Learn this also. The bodies of men have immortal souls which have been clothed with the breath of Elohim and having come uh, forth from Elohim, they are of the same substance, but they are not Elohim. They are not gods. But if they are gods, then in this way the souls of all men, both those who have died and those who are alive and those who shall come into being, are gods. But if a, in a spirit of controversy you maintain that these also are gods, what great matter is it then for Messiah to be called Elohim, for he has only what all have? So, um, Kepha doesn't seem to be of the opinion that Yeshua ever claimed to be um, immortal prior to his his baptism, that he was, um, you know, he was just a, a man because he says he has only what all have. Very interesting. All right, this is a good place to stop. We're at 32 minutes. Um, I think it'd be a good time to break it up. So, thank you for listening and. If uh, me and Kepha haven't scared you away too much with all this uh, talk about the, the nature of Messiah, then uh, come back and join us for the rest of, of this homily. Shalom.